Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? The Roots of Sinful Anger by Jeremy Pierre. The life of a plant is in the roots. You can damage its leaves and branches, even its stem, and the plant can survive. But if you kill the root, you kill the plant. So in the sense, the main life of the plant is the hidden part. That's how anger works. The part you see is not its main life. The parts you see, red faces and quickened pulses, harsh words and forced sighs, raised voices and clenched fists. These are expressions of something deeper. So what is it there in the heart? What do we call the root? condition that leads to sinful expressions of anger. If we go too gener generic with our label, we won't gain much. If we describe our anger merely as sin, we will not gain the insight necessary for overcoming it. Anger in its usual form certainly involves sin. The generic acknowledgement usually doesn't get you beyond generic repentance. We need further insight into the particular way our hearts are sinning that wells up into expressions of anger. Insight into the heart starts with some cold water on a hot face. A really useful source of cold water is James 4, 1 through 10. In this passage, James compels his readers to wake up to the reality going on in the surface of their anger. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this? Your passions are at war within you. Here's my main point. We need humble discernment into our own hearts to understand anger. This discernment is a gift of the Holy Spirit that we must seek. Discernment is the ability to make distinctions, to tell the difference between right and wrong, fitting and unfitting, beautiful as well as repulsive. In other words, your heart is tuned to the sense between what is pleasing and displeasing to the Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Philippians 1, 9 through 11. This discernment is not unlike the ability of a soldier equipped with night vision goggles in a dark place. He can better spot the features around him because he's better able to distinguish the different kinds of darkness. James tells his readers to aim those out goggles not outwardly but inwardly tells them to discern the different kinds of dark inside their own souls. Specifically insists that Christians distinguish the ruling desires are the root of their anger. There's no self-improvement exercise. It is an act of radical submission. It is humility surrendering to the will of God when we find what we find most precious. James says that God jealously yearns that his spirit would be the one dwelling in and ruling our hearts, not our desires. We'll give every grace to distinguish this, and he will oppose every challenge. How do we practice this discernment? The main thing is to have enough trust in God's work in you through Christ to follow the clear commands of the passage, which includes specifics such as submit yourselves to God, draw near to God, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, which can all be summarized in the final command, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Let me offer some practical suggestions for tracing our anger back to the ruling desires of our hearts. This is something that the Spirit of God alone can grant discernment to do, but he does so through means. Those means include our efforts to humble ourselves by identifying and denying ourselves desires 
that have captured us. Sometimes this is easiest to do when we recognize that anger is not a standalone issue. Bad roots lead to bad fruit on more than one branch. Sometimes our anger is so automatic in our responses that it's hard to discern. Sometimes starting with another branch, it traces down to the heart. Tracing your anxiety. Anxiety is such a common experience that the scriptures are always telling us not to fear, but instead to trust the Lord. Matthew 14, 30, 31, Philippians 4, 7. Anxiety is a form of fear, one that grips the soul. People tend to get edgiest about what they're most scared of losing. Tracing that fear back will give you insight into what might be fueling your anger. If a professional is constantly anxious about his job performance, he will likely be angry with anyone who is hindering him from performing. If a person is anxious about security in a certain relationship, she will be angry at any sign of distance or slight. If an adult child is anxious about making it on his own, he'll be angry at everyone who threatens his sense of self-dependence. My point is that sometimes our anxiety gives us clues about our anger. So perhaps we can start by seeking the spirit in prayer or having a conversation with trusted friends about what we're so anxious about. It could reveal what we may be gripping with a closed fist before the Lord. Tracing your discouragements. Discouragement is another form of experience so common that biblical writers are constantly encouraging believers not to lose heart. Discouragement also grips the soul with a heavy hand. Discouragement leaves people raw, weakened, and often edgy. When you feel depressed about, might reveal some of your deepest desires and expectations of life. When we feel hopeless of ever being able to realize those desires we long for, we can become characterized by bitterness, resentment, and outright anger at the unfairness of it all. A teenager is discouraged by not being socially included as he wants, so he rages at everyone around him. A musician has been outperformed on the spot she is wanting and is so constantly irritable with her family. <clears throat> a husband is disappointed how his career has turned out, so he's always on the edge of fury. My point is that we can get most discouraged about may indicate a possible source of anger. So here too, we learn to talk to God and trusted Christians about our discouragements when those discouragements have spilled over into sinful anger. The Lord will be kind to anyone who wishes to identify these connections and no longer be ruled by selfish desires. We turn our attention to Professor or Reverend McGowan in the Protestant Reformed Theological Journal. I'm sorry, the Standard Bearer on Disney and the Don't Say Gay Bill in Disney, Florida. And we're thankful for this article. The acronym LGBTQIA is getting longer. Provision in the Florida law, which is not as sharp as I would like to see, simply restricts such instruction to fourth graders and older. Depending on how you interpret the or after grade three, this legislation does not actually prohibit public classroom on sexual orientation or gender identity to children between ages five kindergarten and nine, but only requires such education be age appropriate or developmentally appropriate. Who decides what is age and developmentally appropriate? Public school unions, professor, educators, psychologists, 
the Department of Education. If a kindergartner called Ben identifies as Melinda and wears a dress and makeup to class, this legislation does not prohibit the teacher talking to the children about it and encouraging that the rest of the children address the child with the preferred pronoun she, her. If a child in first grade has two daddies or two mommies, the legislation does not prohibit the classroom um, from a celebration of the fact. Probably does not even forbid the classroom reading I have two mommies or other books aimed at children. Despite that, the legislation has been labeled hateful and discriminatory. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi tweeted on March 28, 22, this cruel legislation is a front to our nation's cherished values and sends a harmful message to our children. At Governor Ron DeSantis and Florida Republicans have chosen to needlessly bully, isolate, and demean LGBTQ students. She then touted the Equality Act about which I've written before and which has thankfully still not been passed by the U.S. Congress. The official White House Twitter account sent out a tweet by President Joe Biden on February 8, 2022. I want every member of the LGBTQIA plus community, especially the kids who will be impacted by this hateful bill, to know that you are loved and accepted just as you are. I have your back and my administration will continue to fight for the pre protections and safety you deserve. Remember that the only thing that the legislation forbids is classroom instruction about sexual orientation in a way that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for children between ages five and nine. Walt Disney, 1901 to 1966, co-founded the Disney Brothers Studio with his brother, Roy. A company famous for creating animated pictures such as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and adaptations of other fairy tales, and internationally recognized for its company mascot, Mickey Mouse. The Walt Disney Company is now a multinational media and entertainment conglomerate headquartered in Burbank, California. and includes the so-called happiest place on earth, Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando with some 80,000 employees. You might expect that Disney, known for its family-friendly amusement parks and entertainment cartoons aimed at children, would welcome, or at least not oppose, legislation that shields impressionable young minds from sexual matters in Florida's public schools, but you would be sadly mistaken. Disney, like many large multinational companies, promotes the LB, LGBTQI agenda. The current CEO of Disney is Bob Chappick who initially declined to make a statement about the matter. He quickly changed his message following walkouts from staff in protest against the Florida legislation, supposedly in solidarity <coughs> with Disney LGBT employees and their children. In response to the media's mislabeling of the bill, Disney employees chanted, gay, gay, and demanded its repeal. On February 24, Bob Iger, former CEO of Disney, tweeted, if passed, this bill will put vulnerable young LGBTQ people in jeopardy. So false. In early March, Chappick distributed a memo to Disney employees apologizing for his lack of advocacy on the issue. 
He also met with Governor DeSantis to try to persuade him to veto the bill. Chapik's memo is revealing our company has a long history of supporting the LGBTQ community. He reminds his disappointed colleagues, I and the entire leadership unequivocally stand in support of our LGBTQ employees, their families, and their communities, he reassures the staff. He then lists a number of productions, movies, or cartoons, I assume. I've never heard of them, so I will not list them here, and remarks. This and all our diverse stories are corporate statements. We've provided, he adds, nearly $3 million to support the work of LBGQ organizations. And we have a long history of supporting events like Pride Parades. All this is why we have earned a 100% rating from the Human Rights Campaign for 16 years in a row. On March 28, shortly after DeSantis signed the bill, Disney tweeted, Our goal as a company is for this law to be repealed by the legislature or struck down in the courts. We remain committed to supporting the national and state organizations. We are dedicated to standing up for the rights, safeguarding LGBTQ members of the Disney family, as well as that community in Florida and across the country. And the pagans are at the highest levels. Bibliotheca Sacra by Dr. Sweeney on the promise of the Holy Spirit. Quoting now the apostolic tradition. When the purpose being baptized goes down into the water, he who baptizes him, putting his hand on him, shall say, Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? And the purpose person shall say, I believe. Then holding his hand on his head, he shall baptize him once. And then he shall say, you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, was dead and buried and rose again from the third, the third day, alive from the dead, and ascended into heaven and sat down the right hand of the Father will come again to judge the living and the dead. When the person says, I believe, he is baptized again. Again, the deacon shall say, do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the body? The person being baptized shall say, I believe, and he is baptized a third time. Charismatic summaries led to laws of supplications, which in turn ruled early Christian faith, practice, and worship. Early church fathers also published creedal summaries in apologetic texts. Most famously, Justin Martyr, whose first apology, 155 to 57, included several well-known creedal fragments made a series of such statements in his dialogue with Trifo, 155 to 67, which would later appear in the ecumenical creeds. He penned this, for example, in chapter 85, in the name of this very Son of God, the first begotten of all creatures, who was born through the Virgin and became a passable man, was crucified under Pontius Pilate by your people and died and rose again from the dead and ascended to heaven. Every demon is exercised, conquered, and subdued. Such patterns of instruction and belief frequently recurred. With the conversion of the empire, longer teaching aids appeared with, which systemized the Christian faith for use among the swelling ranks of public catechumens, Cyril of Jerusalem promoted such productions. In his catechetical lectures about 348, he exhorted younger Christians 
attend closely to catechizings, and though we should prolong our discourse, let not your mind be worried out. You have many enemies. Take to you many darts. The armor is ready, and most ready, the sword of the spirit. But you also must stretch forth your right hand with good resolution, that you may wage the Lord's warfare and overcome adverse powers and become invincible against every heretical attempt. And we shall continue that lovely article in review of church history. As we pick up the article by Amos Winarto A.E. Between Scylla and Charybdis Mapping Theological Education the new normal in Indonesia. <coughs> Christ like servants of the Lord against the Charybdis of sentimentalism. The other peril that theological institutions ought to carefully map in order to safely pass is the Charybdis of sentimentalism. This parallel manifests itself in the culture of charisma. The culture is best represented by the term influencer. Influencers such as social media celebrities have become a crucial factor for branding and social media marketing campaigns. A recent study even shows that people tend to consider social media celebrities is more traditional than, more trustworthy than traditional celebrities. These days, people can win trust by being popular and having a good deal of followers without even being physically present. This is where the Charybdis problem becomes apparent in theological education. It is the problem of conflating charisma with character. That is, good influence equals good character. The problem becomes more complicated in the arena of leadership. If the proper indicator of leadership, as John Maxwell argues, is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And the more influence a leader exerts, the more people will think at first glance that he is a man of good character. This is also the reason many leaders first focus on developing their charismatic skills, such as relationships, communication, and rhetoric, instead of character. Without charisma, one cannot effectively influence others, and as such will never be competent to lead others. Listen, for example, to this leader's speech. Today, after 2,000 years, with the deepest emotion I recognized more profoundly than ever before, the fact that it was for this that he had to shed his blood upon the cross. As a Christian, I have no duty to allow myself to be cheated, but I have a duty to be a fighter for truth and justice. As a man, I have a duty to see that human society does not suffer the same catastrophic collapse as did the civilization of the ancient world some 2,000 years ago. Take these words at face value. Do they not motivate us to engage in societal betterment? Many would feel the same. There are thousands of people who, upon hearing these words, would applaud and approve and even shout amen. Those words, however, were spoken by Adolf Hitler. He sounds as if his words were driven by scripture and Christian faith. Listeners, no doubt, would have assumed that a good and good-natured person stood before them. But Hitler's words masked deception behind them. We turn to the Babelfest on permaculture. 
Holgram implies here that true ideological certainty is impossible and therefore absolute ethical knowledge is unavailable to us. Nonetheless, the ethically responsible agent risks acting in the real world to develop ourselves as whole persons. Similar to Dean Drummond's environmental ethic, Holgram's environmental ethic not only calls for action in the real world, but sees character development as a key aspect of the goal through that process of taking risk. This integrated existence shares much with Dean Drummond's integral ecology. What fruit then might be born by investigating the possibility of character development through permaculture practice? My argument here is that Holgram's permaculture offers a very strong ecological context for pursuing wisdom and virtue. It takes seriously environmental responsibility in the Anthropocene. Most fundamental in this context is the willingness to try to develop a holistic attempt at ecological living that accepts the risk of imperfection and refuses the temptation to linger indefinitely in academic abstraction and prolegomena on environmental issues, which is the danger of sham prudence. Prudence, however, is the habit of committing ourselves to take action after deliberation. Prudence accepts flawed or insufficient action as elements in the feedback loop that leads to effective action. Good Lord, deliver us. And now for the article by Dr. Shannon on Honor the Emperor, which is from St. Peter in the time of Nero. As our Lord's dress drew near, who defended him? who stood up to the unjust ruler, spoke out against a failing system and demand, demanded vindication now. Kept behind me, Satan, was our Lord's response when the ancient serpent attempted to derail Christ's ministry and mediation through petrine political hope and misguided loyalty. Persecution and injustice under death were essential to the accomplishment of redemption. It was not courage, but cowardice and panic that severed Malchus's ear, as Peter's betrayal proved. Jesus subverted the wiles of the evil one by laying down his life, even interceding in the last moments for those who persecuted him that you may be sons of your father. Peter encourages the church to be subject to the Lord's sake for every human authority. Every ordinance of man or human authority as various translations have it. Commentators quibble over the best English wording the language here denotes all spheres or structures which Peter, to which Peter devotes attention in his epistle, including marriage and family, economy and political authority and order. To each of these structures of culture and human existence, including head of state of one kind or another, the Christian is to be voluntarily subject. Adoption as a son of God underwrites no dismissive hubris. Quite the contrary, the Christian is to be mindful of the Lord's hand and call to glorify him in and through institutions. Regarding political life specifically, Peter says that governors are sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. 
as Paul has written with categorical clarity. There is no authority except from God. Being subject to human authority is therefore obedience to God. As John Murray points out, the decretive will of God is not the focus here. Sent by him, as Peter says, is not the same as foreordained by him. The divine appointment in view, says Murray, has to do with the governance according to the preceptive will of God. And therefore, on the administration of the Lord's own revealed distinction between good and evil. And if the magistrate is tasked with fulfilling God's preceptive will, we conclude with Murray that it would be sinful for him to refrain from doing so. The magistrate thus wields a heavenly commission that hangs on the faithfulness to the law of God. Divine commission accompanies God's own law. Not any person or administration, party, office, or title. Political godliness is not a subjective possession. There's no imputation of civic integrity. Nor, on the other hand, may we assume that divine approval will always accompany divine appointment any more than the Lord. The Lord's tilting a boiling pot away from the north suggests that Nebuchadnezzar was a godly man, or that Babylonian rule was legitimate. Even so, seek the welfare of the city, Jeremiah 29.7, hardly leaves room for revolution. Christians should not refuse, Martin Luther says, under the pretext of religion to obey men, especially evil men. John Mer Murray even puts the American founding in its theological place when he says in Romans 13, excludes from the outset every notion to the effect that authority in the state rests upon agreement on the part of the governed and upon the consent of the governed. Authority to govern and subjection demanded of the government governed reside wholly in the fact of the divine institution. If we are willingly subject to human authority when all is politically well good, what reward do we have? It is particularly when the exercise of power runs afoul of the law of God that political obedience bears subversive witness to the absolute justice of God in the hopes of mercy. Uh, long talking, what are you saying? And now we are doing a book review by Ruth Myers of Worship and Mission by Crider. The rise of foot washing service, equal treatment with baptism and Eucharist. Anabaptist historical texts feature prominently along with examples of contemporary Mennonite communities in different parts of the world. But they also utilize sources and examples from another number of traditions. They consider churches of different sizes and configurations. Overall, the book offers a solid ecumenical reflections on practices of worship and mercy mission in the context of post-Christendom. The emergence of post-Christendom is a key theme. In several places, Crider and Crider contrasts the situation of the church before, during, and after Christendom. Yet only in an appendix do they explore the ways in which Americans today both are and are not living in Christendom. Their argument would have been even stronger had they acknowledged this dual reality from the outset. The book would have benefited from an introductory overview of the structure. Crider and Crider weave back and forth between worship and mission in different historical periods. Actions of worship discussed in chapter nine reappear in chapter 12 discussion of the experience of outsiders, although the authors do not make this explicit. 
In these chapters, they explore some, but not all, actions of worship. This is a hopeful book, facing squarely the needs of the world while inviting readers to confident engagement in God's mission. I commend it to all Christian leaders concerned with the vitality of Christianity in our emerging post-Christendom context. We turn now to another book review by Glenn Moots of Northwood University, entitled uh, Calvin's Company of Pastors, Pastoral Care and Emer Emerging Reformed Church, Oxford Press, 2012. Scott Mantich has produced a remarkable book. Calvin's company of pastors began during Manch's researching of Theodore Beza for another project. But while working through the city archives, Mantich found himself learning all about Calvin's and Beza's Geneva. Among his subsequent research into the sermons, correspondence, and ecclesiastical records of Geneva's ministers, the manuscript minutes of the consistory were particularly significant. The consistory was Geneva's disciplinary body of ministers and elders who met weekly beginning in 1542, and it is on this subject that we should note how Match's book is distinguished from its predecessors. We turn now to Westminster Journal. Dr. Hibbs on the eternally communicating God. This profound truth is reflected in every particular word of human language. Consider the sentence, there's a stone on the driveway, but there is structure in English is used to introduce a delayed subject so we can rewrite the sentence, a stone is on the driveway. Each of these words has elements of classification, instantiation, and association. First, each word can be classified grammatically according to some part of speech. A is classified as an indefinite article used to introduce one of a set of count no nouns, which is the classification for stone. The verb is would be classified as a linking verb relating subject and predicate. On is classified as a preposition often suggesting that reader or listener know which driveway is being referenced. Lastly, driveway is another member of set of count nouns in this second year. This analogous to the way in which the Father is classified as God throughout Scripture, even Jesus makes this classification when he speaks of the Father. Each of the words in this sentence is also an instantiation, the unique variant of the occurrence of that form. This is especially clear in speech. Each time this sentence is spoken, we encounter unique instantiation of every word. The speed at which one person's vocal cords vibrate differ from that of the neighbor. The pitch and intonation used in pronunciation will vary slightly. And even the longevity of each articulated sound will not be precisely identical from one speaker to another. In fact, even for the same speaker, there is nuance and variety. I never say my name precisely the same way twice. Recording equipment would pick up differences in consonant and vowel sounds, intonation, and so on. These instantiations of the words we speak do not mean that we speak of the words that are essentially different. Rather, they are essentially identical. This is analogous in the way the Son is essentially one with the Father, but personally distinct 
from the Father. The Son is a unique manifestation of the divine essence, the perfect image. Lastly, each word in a sentence is bound with associations to other words and other world reference. A is a singular, but is bound up associatively with plural nouns, which contrasts with it. You know, singularity in relationship to plurality. This is getting way too wonky. Nice, true grammatical stuff. Now, what are we going to get out of Bart again? How many more pages of this dreary article? Too many. To be sure, federal theology does not advocate for a paradigm of gospel and then law. So yes, gospel comes after law. However, that is not to say that federal theology placed divine grace after law at the beginning of God's way with man. In contrast, federal theologians, at least following consensus 17th century federal theology, recognized and affirmed that the covenant of works was itself grounded in God's condescending to humans graciously in a benevolent manner. Before the fall into sin, the paradisal covenant was not merely or strictly a works-based or law-fulfillment covenant. It was not for the following reasons. Human beings do not need a covenant with God in order to owe God all that is due to God as God. That is, they owe him trust, devotion, subservience, and love, obedience, merely by the fact that they are his rational moral creatures, such as do God as God. Therefore, merit in any strict sense is excluded. Law fulfillment does not merit reward in as much as creatures have nothing to give to God that has not been bestowed upon them by God. Thus, both condign merit, full merit, and congruent merit, half merit, are excluded. Three, blessedness in the way of law fulfillment requires that the reward be proportional or equal to the obedience rendered. But such is not the case. And again, the obedience rendered, if it had been rendered, is owed to God anyway. There is then no strict reward. If the alleged law paradigm applied to federal theology in the way Bart suggests, and God would be obliged from justice to bless or reward obedience to him as a matter of equity. But that is not so. In fact, the covenant of works simply states that God, who owes us nothing, rewards obedience rendered to him, not from strict justice, <clears throat> but from his benevolent favor. And so blessedness following after obedience to God is purely gratuitous, unearned, and unmerited. That God would bless such trust and love and obedience is only according to his own kindly or gracious and loving covenantal arrangement. This is what is referred to in federal theology as ex pacto merit. Blessedness which follows after human obedience to God according to God's gracious arrangement. It is not a matter of God being indebted to humans, but God benevolently rewarding obedience in keeping with his promise. God is true to himself. Such obedience, to be genuine obedience, includes trusting God, believing him, believing in him, and loving him. Obedience is not abstracted from a living relationship of friendship and fellowship with God. It certainly is not a matter of raw and cold conformity to a raw and cold set of requirements of the law. Bart, this depicts the covenant of works, this being the original and law-driven vantage point as if covenant with Adam 
or a set of arbitrary power without any grace or kindliness in it. That, however, is not an accurate description of the covenant of works. Instead, that covenant was itself an act of grace, placing humans in a new relationship with God's will, such that now an avenue was open for eschatological blessings, infallible and eternal. The covenant of works was not God acting toward man as a begrudging ogre. Rather, it shows God stooping to open a way of fruitfulness and fellowship with God, a way that applies in the glory to come in Christ Jesus as well. That fruitfulness is not found in the first Adam, but in the second Covenant is the divine gift by which God opens the pathway to blessedness with him. It is the path that requires God himself condescending to enact such an arrangement. Being a covenant arrangement includes promise from free grace to bless trusting him obedience already owed and otherwise unblessed. Turn to the churchman to finish the book review of, by this, of this Roman Catholic Stanton about Martin Luther. Someone ought to produce a biography which allows Luther to speak unencumbered by what followed, and thus allow the man to be judged based on what he was trying to achieve rather than with their own axes to grind. Stanford has therefore three goals in mind. First, to enable the reader to understand Luther's complex personality. Secondly, to explain his theology at a popular level. Thirdly, to place Luther and this theology in its historical context, and thus is attempting to show why and how Luther had the effect on what history records. What do you want? What? This? I don't want to miss any phone calls. Stanford's biography then attempts to bring Luther to the people who, having been stripped of myths and accretions of the past five centuries, by basing the book solely on Luther's own works and the Tischbrecht Kedrin, whatever, table talk, in the last quarter of Luther's life. Such an approach certainly isn't afraid to sacrifice some sacred cows of Luther mythology, such as nailing the 95 theses to the door, or Luther's famous phrase, here I stand, I can no other, in the process. To my mind, Stanford largely achieves what he sets out or an accessible, easy-to-read biography which introduces the reader to complex theology, history, and sociology without allowing the narrative to be bogged down in technical niceties. One gets a sense of Luther as an interesting man of his time who has attractive and ugly characteristics which when combined with courage and a sense of divine calling, culminated in a man afraid to take on the world and win. This is a biography for those who wish to dip their toes in Christian history without wading in too deep. And this is a book for priests and people alike. If you mark the Reformation anniversary in no other way, why not mark it by reading Stanford's biography, gaining a fresh perspective on a pivotal moment in the history of the church? Love him or loathe him, you certainly will not be able to stop reading about him if you do. Now for Mark Strauss's book, it's under an exegetical commentary on the New Testament. The ZECNT series is quickly becoming my number one go to series for New Testament study and preparation. 
At first, the convoluted layout can seem overwhelming, but once you get used to it, you find that every section of a given passage has a purpose and use. We'll pick that up again. Global Anglican on uh, Beyond Male and Female. Our redemption's relationship to creation shapes sexual ethics. Where Sarim appears in Isaiah 56.3, the focus is not directly on biological markers, but the religious status. The eunuch is placed in parallel with the foreigner. Whilst it's not clear what kind of eunuch Isaiah 56.3 has in mind, Delich makes the timeless suggestion that it refers to those who had been mutilated against their wills that they might serve at heathen courts. Isaiah 39.7 For these unfruitful trees returning from exile, their fear of exclusion is valid in light of Deuteronomy 23.1 expressing that no kind of emasculated person to enter the congregation of Jehovah. In Isaiah 56.3, serene could represent the ambiguous bodies of intersexuality. But given the intertext of Psalm 39.7, combined with the explicit concern for infertility, seems more likely that Serene refers to a castrated male than to a congenital condition. The Franz's off-cited biblical text of Deuteronomy 23.1 where the word Serene does not appear, but the Franz discerns the concept of intersexuality. However, the juxtaposition of eunuchs and foreigners in the pericope of Deuteronomy 23.1-8 further intimates that those who are bruised, crushed, and have a severed male organ are in fact castrated individuals, perhaps associated with pagan worship and not those born with genital, congenital conditions. The phrase bruised, crushed does not indicate which part of the body is damaged, although scholars typically agree that the noun shaf Bob refers to the penis. It is a hopox legomena in the Old Testament, challenging semantic certainty. The translational test is evidenced further by the Septuagint rendering of the whole phrase as Galadius, likely a euphemism. Given, <coughs> indeed, given the free passive participle. It remains unclear whether the damage referred to is inflicted by the self or others. Only in a theological journal do we get that. Now we turn to the Reformed Presbyterian Journal. The editor is describing what it means to be a true Christian. So that faith is not a transient act, but a, an abiding principle. In brief, in saving faith, Christ in the covenant way of salvation through him, being perceived by the understanding, enlightened by the Holy Ghost, is cordially approved, embraced with assured confidence, and relied on for salvation. Hey, student of Turton, good to see you. We're reading the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Journal of 1837. We have found this online, so we're working our way through. It's, what, 40-some years, 50-some years after the founding of this, you know, the U.S. Constitution of 1789. It's 24 years before the outbreak of the Civil War, and we're getting a really good look at confessional Presbyterianism. And the writer is giving us a good description of what constitutes a true Christian. And we can see his confessional, Westminster confessional approach 
on view. We have high standards for high churchmen. That is, we hold a high view of the Westminster Confession. We see that every single day that we refer to sections of the Confession. This is a peculiar endowment of the Christian by which he is mystically united to his redeeming head, partakes of all the benefits of the covenant of grace, and is called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath named. Number three, this faith works by love and purifies the heart through the approbation of Christ as Savior, which enters into the essence of justifying faith, is of the nature of love. And through and though faith never is and never can be separated from love, yet love is a distinct operation of the will. As God in Christ is infinitely amiable and an object worthy of all the heart, so the believer loves him for this excellency. The language of the heart is this, Psalm 95 verse, Psalm 45 verse two, thou art fairer than the children of men, grace is poured into thy lips. Song of Solomon 1.3, because of the savor of the good ointments, thy name is as an ointment poured forth. Zechariah 9 7, how great is thy beauty. Psalm 73 25, whom do I have in heaven but thee? There is none on earth that I desire besides thee. That love to God which the law requires with the whole heart, soul, strength, and mind is awakened by the view which a believer has of his glory and beauty. Yet there never has been an exercise of this principle in any of the creatures separate from a perception of his goodness. Angels love God, not only for his infinite loveliness, but for the goodness by which he replenishes them with the perfection of blessedness. It is evidently impossible for them to separate these motives to love their creator. David says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice in my supplication, Psalm 96, 1. It is for all the mercies of which he had been made to partake, that disinterested love of being in general, of which hop. Kinsians treat so largely in their sermons and theological works never existed anywhere but in the mouths of men and on paper. It is in view of the goodness and mercy of Jehovah that Paul exclaims in the transports of love and admiration, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Romans 11.33, it is in the plan and work of redemption wherein he bestows the greatest blessing on us. That the most glorious display of the divine excellency is made both to angels and to men. And we turn now to the Protestant. Princeton Theological Review of 1837, where the reviewers are challenging um, an address at the 1836 assembly. The author unfairly institutes an implied comparison between the General Assembly and the more permanent boards or executive committees of voluntary societies but the comparison should be between the assembly and the home missionary society itself. The assembly does not enter into the details of conducting missions. It is merely the appointing and controlling body. The question, therefore, is which is worthy of most reliance as an appointing body? The representatives of all churches or a promiscuous assembly collected from all parts of the Union for a few days in the city of New 
New York and whose members owe their seats and votes to the mere payment of a subscription. Had we or anyone else attempted to undervalue the Home Missionary Society on the ground that it was impossible, and a number of men coming from a distance remaining together but a few hours, practically ignorant of the business, change more or less every year, could be competent to conduct the complicated and delicate work of domestic missions, what would the friends of the American Home Missionary Society think of such an argument? Would they not say we know better, that we know very well that it is not fluctuating subscribers collected for a few hours at a business meeting that really conduct the work of missions, but that this matter is committed to a core of able and efficient men at their post? Would they not tell us that the society was the mere appointing and controlling body authorized to redress grievances and correct abuses should any arise. With the same propriety, we may ask this writer and his friends <coughs> if they do not know that their argument, as above stated, is unfair and deceptive, whether they are not aware that the board and its executive committee appointed by the assembly are as permanent as their own, and as much conversant with the works of mission, we think the General Assembly need not shrink from a comparison with the Home Missionary Society. The members of the former are ordained ministers of the gospel and ruling elders of the churches, men whose moral and religious character has received the sanction of their Christian brethren in various forms. The members of the latter may be, and we have no doubt are, very good men. But who they are, it is hard to tell. And anyone who will comply with the rules as to subscription, no matter what his character, has as much right to vote as the best and wisest members of the body. We'll pick this up again. Seems must have been an issue back then. And now for Protestant Reformed Theological Journal, Introduction to Church Holidays from Haritha Moore to Kerkin. In addition to Sunday, the churches shall observe Christmas Day, Easter, Pentecost, and Ascension Day. The observance of second, day, second holidays is left to the freedom of the churches. As was adopted by the Synod of Dort in 1619, Article 67, in addition to Sunday, the churches shall observe Christmas Day, Easter, and Pentecost with the following days. And because in most of the cities and provinces of the Netherlands are also, in addition, observed the day of circumcision, and the day of ascension, the office bearer shall work with magistrates wherever that is not yet the custom that they conform themselves to the others. The Protestant Reformed churches in America use the revision of the church order that was made by the Christian Reformed Church in North America in 1914. Article 67 from our church order reads, the churches shall observe, in addition to Sunday, also Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, Ascension Day, Pentecost, the Day of Prayer, the National Thanksgiving Day, and Old and New Year's Day. What second day holidays and day of circumcision we shall see soon enough. We will also see why the difference in the list of recognized holidays is important for our understanding of special days. The basic principle which guides the use of special days is that they are not Sabbaths. Sunday the Sabbath is an institution of God. Ecclesiastical holidays are an institution of the church. They exist in the church order in order to serve specific and important purposes. Holidays may not be given the status of Sabbath, 
Sundays for the New Testament Church until the return of Christ. The New Testament Church has changed and is allowed to change her list of recognized special sad Sundays. Concordia Theological Journal on Herman Sassa or through word and sacraments as through instruments the Holy Spirit is given and who works faith where and when it pleases God in those who hear the gospel. Thus article 5 of the Augustana speaks against churchless mysticism of the Schwarmerton enthusiasm. It was clear for Sass that a concrete classical New Testament Christology was the only remedy for theologies it saw in the New Testament, only a beautiful religious experience, pious sentiment, and useful ethics. Such persons will not understand this quest for the one truth. In the Social Doctrine of the Augsburg Confession, 1930, Sass provides definite dogmatic commentary regarding the office by explicating Augsburg Confession 16 and 23 on the two realms, church and state. Thus, the two governments, the spiritual and the secular, should not be confused and mixed together. For the spiritual power has its command to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. It should not become an office foreign and contrary to its nature. It should not enthrone and remove kings. It should not do away with secular obedience should not prescribe laws for secular power and secular affairs, as Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. Sasa notes several attempts to Christianize the world, including the heresy of the social gospel in the Anglican world, the heresy of the Christian state in Germany, and Rome's attempt to ecclesiasticize the world. All are born of fanaticism, blur the teaching of Christ, and lead to precisely the same result with the secularization of Christendom. The authority of the church or bishops give eternal goods and is exercised through the preaching office. Augsburg Confession 28. 1931 referat. The end of May 1931, Sass presented a paper at the second study week of the German Committee for Faith and Order of the Churches, La Swain in Soest. We'll pick that up again. We turn to Princeton Theological Journal with another book review. Brad Embry, Ronald Hearns and Archie T. Wright, Early Jewish Literature and Anthology, Grand Rapids, 2018. Who is this one done by another graduate student at Princeton? We presume David Wallace, assistant of New Testament, well, Regent University. This makes a way, its way here. Early Jewish literature and anthology provides a fresh introduction to the literature from the Second Temple period by presenting an in-volume access to a wide range of primary material used by Jewish groups in the first centuries BC and AD. Because of the importance of this literature to some early Christian communities, Highlighted points of contact related to the New Testament are discussed in introductory sections. The two-volume work is arranged by literary genre based on form and theme. A description of the specific characteristics of each genre is given at the beginning of Chapter 1. Volume 1 includes scriptural texts and traditions such as the Book of Daniel, additions to Daniel, the great Isaiah scroll, and Psalms at Qumran. Two, interpretive history. 
Selected Books of Maccabees and Josephus, three romanticized narratives such as Tobit, Joseph, and Asenath, and the life of Adam and Eve, four biblical interpretation and rewritten scripture, jubilees, and representative Qumran scrolls. And we'll bring that to an end here. So we shift to the Reformed Theological Journal, an earlier one a couple of years back. We get here the discussion of in advance, in support of male only deacons. Concerning our topic, first Timothy 5 3 to 16 is another example of God's concern for the material disadvantaged within the church. Families of widows in the church were the first line of defense, Isaiah 58, 7. Apparently for younger godly widows who needed help, the corporate church temporarily helped. However, for the true and godly widows, the corporate church was to take permanent responsibility. One assumes that the responsibility for these enrolled widows would rest with the deacons. And depending on the nature of required personal care, washing the body, the responsibility may partially be assigned to the wives and women mentioned in 1 Timothy 3.11. There's no biblical evidence that the enrolled widows of some kind of official or unordained board with responsibilities. Pick that up again later as we shift to Southwest Theological Journal. And are we near closed? We're not yet at the close of this long talk. This is on the book of Hebrews and the use of the Old Testament. Based on Pierce's work, I've explored divine speech more fully in connection with the spirit in Hebrews. There are two passages in which the Spirit speaks to the audience. Psalm 95 in Hebrews 3 and Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews 10. These part passages are particularly interesting because the text at one time presented as God speaking and another time presented as the Spirit speaking. When the text is directly applied to the audience, the speaker is presented as the spirit. Significantly, these recitations often involve significant alteration to the scripture citations, alterations that amplify the significance of the contemporary application. Number five, chain quotations and exempla. Two additional exegetical techniques employed by the author to appropriate the Old Testament can be mentioned briefly. Chain quotations, hazas to string, are a series of Old Testament quotations linked by the same word or expression. For example, the sun in citations from Psalm 2.7 and 2 Samuel 7.14 in Hebrew 1.5. The chain of quotations is also linked by the use of various introductory formulas. Again, Hebrews 1, 5 through 13 offers a good example of this technique, where three pairs of Old Testament citations are strung together and capped off with the citation of Psalm 110, 1. An exemplum or exemplar list is a rhetorical device that presents a long list of individuals worthy of emulation. Examples are found both in Jewish and early Christian literature. The example of Hebrews 11 is particularly striking. Beginning with Abraham, discussion of each exemplar becomes increasingly compressed such that the final group gives the impression that the list could go on almost indefinitely. <clears throat> the effect is strong encouragement for perseverance. Turn now to Thamelius and Luke. I'm sorry, Leviticus and Christ. 
Given this, it is natural to read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 as a reflection of this theme, with the Sabbath commandment bridging the commandments about God with the commandments about our neighbor. If the purpose of the Ten Commandments in Exodus is to reflect this coming together that God has achieved through Israel, then it would be natural to read this as a type of the unity between God and humanity achieved by Christ. On the other hand, with respect to each law's purpose within the Old Covenant, we've already seen that the Sabbath commandment should be understood as a law of honor whereas the other nine commandments should likely be understood as laws of life. Thus, studying the Ten Commandments as a passage in the context of Exodus yields different result to studying merely the purposes of the law mentioned therein. The former does not help us determine whether the Sabbath commandment is still a guide for daily life of Christ, Blah, blah, blah. Conclusion. We have arrived then at a method for reading the laws of Leviticus in the light of Christ. When approaching a law or set of laws, we start by analyzing its term in terms of two components. The purpose of the overarching section to which it belongs, given the structure of Leviticus, and two the particular way it is expressed in relation to the old covenant realities. Insofar as a law serves a purpose which has been completed by Christ, we should seek to understand it typologically when reading it in light of Christ, rather than to find some guidance in it in daily life. In this regard, we have said that because of Christ, we no longer need to go approach God in a temple external to ourselves, and that therefore the purpose behind the laws of approach remain relevant only in a typological sense. We no longer lead, need to purify ourselves before approaching God as provide atonement for ourselves or community for enjoying fellowship with him. On the other hand, we continue to live in God's presence and he continues to deserve honor. And so the purposes behind the laws of life and laws of honor remain relevant to the way in which we live our daily lives. In such cases, the expression of the law plays an important role in how we read it in light of Christ. This is because even if the purpose of such laws remain relevant, the particular expression we have within Leviticus may depend on things that have changed since they were originally given. Broadly speaking, there are three options here. A law may be expressed in terms of old covenant realities that have been radically altered by the ushering in of the new covenant. Two. It may be expressed in terms of ancient practices or features of life that have changed with the passage of time. Three, it may be expressed so generally as to not depend upon anything that has changed between the giving of the law and the coming of Christ. To the extent that old covenant realities have analogs in the new covenant, we may repurpose the law with the remainder being left to a typological reading. To the extent that the ancient practices resemble modern practices, we may repurpose the law. It is noteworthy that these options resemble the traditional threefold division of the law into the ceremonial, civil, and moral. This aligns with the suggestion we mentioned at the outset that the threefold division can be seen as an account of the categories of applications rather than as an exegetical tool. It tells us the possible outcomes of the hermeneutical method, but not how we should arrive at these outcomes. Our proposal recognizes these categories, connects them to a broader hermeneutical method, 
and provides an exegetical framework for applying the method to Leviticus. That is now over. Thank you. Now for the Journal of Theological Studies of 1908. We'll see if the editor is coming to some conclusion. This conviction of the reality of spiritual power within seems to be a demonstration of the possibility of spiritual power in the world without. As St. Paul felt when he argued from the rising from sin to the rising from the dead. The consciousness of a creative force within is a conviction which does not and cannot remain merely subjective. It is an inspiring power and finds expression in this as in every other age in the fruits of the spirit and the works to which they prompt. Christian experience renewed in each generation is the abiding confirmation of the faith. Such confirmation of the faith need not be, perhaps cannot be, an exact repetition of the first conviction, but rather the proving of the old power under new conditions and circumstances. It cannot be given to one human mind to grasp the whole range of the relationship between the finite and infinite as it has come home to millions of Christians of many different races and temperaments. The conviction in each individual consciousness is limited and partial. It is an experience of the church as a whole that the religious truth which was manifested in the person of Christ is confirmed in all its parts. There's a great heritage of traditional belief and devout practice which has been handed down and is embodied for us in the prayer book. So far as any part of this body of religious belief becomes a real conviction to any of us, it is confirmed in personal experience and is set forth as a living power. Section 6, and now as to the defense of the faith. There have been two notable periods in Christian apology, one in the primitive times and one in the 18th century. The aim in the two cases was different. In the 18th century, they sought to prove the truth of Christianity positively. The early apologists had been try, content to try and disarm the prejudices against it. Justin Martyr and others could not attempt to show that their religion exactly fitted with ordinary belief and practice. They admitted that it was quite different, but they tried despite tried to show that despite these differences, it was neither mischievous nor foolish. In the circumstances of modern society, we shall do well to follow these earlier writers in their humbler aim. We shall not be wise not to set ourselves to demonstrate the strength of our own position or to denounce those who do not accept it. We may merely endeavor to get them to go with us so far as they can. Now for the article on guilt. Forget the doctor's name. The infinite extensibility of guilt. The therapeutic view of guilt seems to offer the guilt-ridden an avenue of escape from its power by redefining guilt as the result of psychic forces that do not relate to anything morally consequential. But that has not turned out to be an entirely workable solution since it's not so easy to banish guilt merely by denying its reality. There's another powerful factor at work, too, one that might be called the infinite extensibility of guilt. This proceeds from a very different set of assumptions and is a surprising byproduct of modernity's proudest achievement. It's ceaselessly expanding capacity to comprehend and control the physical world. 
in a world in which web of relationships between causes and effects yields to increasing human understanding and manipulation, and in which human agency therefore becomes ever more powerful and effective, the range of our port, 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 potential moral responsibility, therefore our potential guilt also steadily expands. We like to speak romantically of the interconnectedness of all things, failing to recognize that this simple principle means that there is almost nothing for which we cannot be in some way held responsible. This is one inevitable side effect of the growing movement to change the name of our geological epoch from the Holocene to the Anthropocene the first era in the life of the planet being defined by the effects of the human presence and human power. Effects such as nuclear fallout, plastic pollution, domesticated animals, and anthropogenic climate change. Power entails responsibility, and responsibility leads to guilt. We'll continue that interesting article. Now for the Trinity uh, Seed and Harvest of Trinity School of Ministry. An article by Reverend Henry Thompson, Dean President. How does renovating an old Presbyterian church complete the Trinity campus? Dean President Thompson makes the case. Competent is hospitality amidst living relationships. A Trinity donor asked me why put resources into restoring an old building when money is needed for school operations, student scholarships, and global partnerships. <clears throat> it is an important question and deserves a thoughtful answer. How does the Trophimus Center project assist to address the mission to be global center? of Christian formation, producing outstanding leaders who can plant, renew, and grow churches that make disciples of Jesus Christ. In the first decade of Trinity's history, the word campus sounded like a misnomer. Yet that small group of faculty, staff, and students jury-rigged what they had to do to welcome from the outside world to equip saints lay and clergy, to share in the thoughtful world of learning and worship of Christ. Since then, the physical campus grew to include commons, hall, administration building, and the renovated library and classroom building, formerly an old grocery store. These buildings facilitate excellence in the teaching function, as well as inviting encouraging environment within which to study. As the school's influence grew, more and more students and visitors wanted to come and interact with the community. Yet the spaces available to house and host these people were impractical at best. Over time, doors opened for the seminary, resulting in an attractive 31 bedroom hotel adjacent to what is now the Winterer Field, an elegant place, piece of land for student recreation. Yet hosting our own large events, let alone partners events, remains a challenge. Our commons hall space is not ideal for meetings and is regularly utilized for campus needs, feeding hungry students and their families being chief among them. The chapel's legal maximum is 95 persons. Needless to say, COVID-19 pandemic makes these spaces even more limited and unwelcoming to large groups. In order to offer a sincere welcome, we need a larger space for gatherings, conferences, and worship. The Trophimus Center is a last missing link to make our campus footprint suitable to such hospitality. And for our last article, we turn to the 
this interesting article in Reform Faith and Practice on that heretic Fosdick, where he describes his religion as a contagion and coercive. In his autobiography, Fosdick reflected sounding more like an adult than a child, some of the wretched hours of his boyhood. I think we read this. Yes, we did. In 1900, Fosdick graduated from Colgate University, where his thinking was profoundly shaped by a liberal Baptist theologian, William Newton Clark, 1841 to 1912. At Colgate, Fosdick became a firm believer in evolution and a skeptic toward Orthodox Christianity. When he first fought, felt a call to ministry in college, most of his classmates were surprised. By his own admission, as a college student, he was a better dancer than a theologian. In fact, so eviscerated was his faith, Fosdick wondered whether any church would want him for a pastor. Here's Fosdick. I was through with orthodox dogma. I had not the faintest interest in any sect or denomination. I could not have told clearly what I believed about any major Christian doctrine. I did not see how any denomination could accept me as a minister. But I did not care. I wanted to make a contribution to the spiritual life of my own generation. Now, there's some real first-rate hubris. In time, however, crowds would clamor for Fosdick, the minister. After graduating with a Bachelor of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in New York City in 1904, Fosdick was ordained to the Baptist ministry and took the pulpit of First Baptist Church in Montclair, New Jersey. After pastoring in Montclair for more than a decade, Fosdick crossed the Hudson and served three different churches in New York City. First Presbyterian, 1918 to 25, Park Avenue Baptist, 1925 to 1930, and Riverside Church, 1930 to 46. The interdenominational church, whose 2,500-seat Gothic cathedral was conceived and financed by John D. Rockefeller, Jr., with the intention that Fosdick would be the senior pastor. Fosdick also taught homiletics at Union Theological Seminary from 1915 to 46. By all accounts, Fosdick was one of the most prominent preachers of the 20th century. He wrote 47 books, numerous articles, and the well-known hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. Martin Luther Jr. called Fosdick the greatest preacher of the century. Labeled as modernism's Moses, Fosdick was a spirit, spiritual inspiration to some and a singular instance of spiritual declension to others. When Ivy Lee, a leading advertising executive and member of Fosdick's church, saw to it that shall fundamentalists win were sent to every ordained Protestant ministry in the country, and that the sermon was reprinted in numerous liberal periodicals, there was bound to be quick and vociferous response. For Orthodox Presbyterians, Fosdick was everything they had feared, and everything they feared was wrong with their denomination. In Fosdick's telling, shall the fundamentalists win was a plea for tolerance a good faith petition for the church to take in both liberals and conservatives without either driving out the other. And yet even Robert Motes Miller, Fosdick's sympathetic biographer, acknowledges that Fosdick was kidding himself by characterizing the sermon in that way. What were conservative Presbyterians to think when this Baptist declared himself from a Presbyterian pulpit belief in the virgin birth is not essential, 
the inerrancy of scriptures incredible the second coming of christ from the skies and outmoded phrasing of hope mired in denominational controversy and feeling the sting of criticism Fosdick res resigned his pastorate at the old church. They call me a heretic, Fosdick said in his farewell sermon. Well, I am a heretic if conventional orthodoxy is the standard. I should be ashamed to live in this generation and not be a heretic, a champion for true liberalism. The purpose of this article is not to evaluate Fosdick's ministry, judged by historic Christian orthodoxy, let alone by the confessions of the Presbyterian Church. Fosdick is a cautionary tale in how to end up on the wrong side of Machen's Christianity and liberalism divide. Judged by the internal logic of liberalism, Fosdick is a successful example, outdated though it may be, of how one man reached out to an unbelieving world with a message of Christian spirituality to those who might not have listened otherwise. The idea of liberal theology, writes Gary Dorian, professor at Fosdick's alma mater, Union Theological Seminary, is the 300-year-old idea that Christian theology can be genuinely Christian without being based upon external authority. Liberalism is the belief that religion should be modern and progressive from the standpoint of modern knowledge and experience. It is the conviction that one can be a faithful Christian without believing in hell or in a universal flood, without believing that God commanded the extermination of the Canaanites, and without believing that God demanded a literal sacrifice of his son as a substitutionary legal payment for sin. And here we end this edition of Theological Journals. God be for us, who can be against us? Jesus, be thou our teacher. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God speak.